Welcome back and thanks for standing with us on Morning Express today on ADBN Television. Now, we'll be getting into a very interesting conversation on the show still today, and that will be on state creation. In Nigeria, state creation has been a very, very important um, topic of discourse. As we've seen, even at the National Assembly, uh, there's been calls by different uh, uh, people to create more state in the country. However, with this comes the issue of economic stability and regional inclusion. This will be what we'll be looking at today on the show. And joining me this morning to have this discussion, I have Barrister Clifford Thomas, who is a legal practitioner. Good morning to you, Barrister. Good morning. Uh, it's nice to be here. And I also Good have morning, with viewers. Oh, very well, thank you. Mm. And um, I also have with me also Mr. Zari Yusuf, um, the spokesperson, Big Tent, who is a uh, governance uh, advocacy group. Good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning, viewers. It's time to get into the conversation. I I'd like to hear your view, uh, Barrister Thomas, uh, when we talk about state creation as it's been on the front burner in the country. For you, what's your take? Do you think Nigeria is at the point where we need more state creation? Well, um, if Nigeria is actually a true federal establishment or federal um, a country practicing federalism, uh, it ought to have component parts. And those component parts are actually the state, the region, or the province. Um, well, they say Nigeria is a federal state. I still have my doubts. Because in practice, we do a lot of uh, unitary um, model, unitary model. That's why the center is over concentrated and so strong that the component parts find it difficult to break. But even the component parts, including the, the local government, which are part of the state system, uh, you also notice that uh, until recently, when the Supreme Court judgment was given, they didn't have that elixir of, um, of um, freedom to operate as development centers. Rather, they've been more of corruption centers. But um, states in Nigeria have never been created by the National Assembly by civilians. States have always been created by the military establishment. And for this National Assembly, the 10th National Assembly, to push for state creation, uh, we, if they try to meet that demand, uh, there are more demands for states than we could economically um, uh, work with. The viability of states, some people are saying that some states are not viable, or when those states are created, they may not be viable. I tend to disagree. There is no state in this country that does not have comparative advantage, economically, socially, politically, that does not have social advantage. If you take a state like Jigawa, for instance, Jigawa could harness the sun resources it has and export same or sell same to other states. By the time Jigawa state, for instance, is able uh, to Jigawa, Yube, and some other uh, states which are, have the advantage of excessive sunlight, by the time they harness this, they could raise up to 30,000 megawatts of electricity, which could be sold. And they make, they make their taxes, their monies from it. So there's no state that is not viable. It's just that the federal establishment or federal government over time has made the states to become lazy, weak, and overtly dependent by making them come to Abuja at the end of every month, capping and begging for resources. And uh, we have always opposed it. Since I'm a civil society practitioner and a development uh, practitioner, we have always opposed this. Allow states generate their resources. Allow states utilize their resources and pay a token for tax to the center. And the center could use that. Zamfara is not only Zamfara that has gold, but it has its in large quantity. So there are states that will be created or that, that could be created that will have more resources and better management of those resources. So, and uh, it, it will lead more to um, better security 
for the people because they know we are, are producing or using what we have to make our money, which we control, when we pay tax, which every other state will pay. Assuming the tax is 15%, you pay to the center. In Yobe State, for instance, they generate uh, on a monthly basis, they generate uh, more than 40 billion uh, naira. They pay 15% of that. And 15% of that will be about 6 billion to the federation's account. So you have 34 billion left for you to use. So people will become more satisfied. And you'll be able to see the people in your state more. Instead of waiting for this top bottom approach, you do a bottom top approach to development. And that way, the people are more involved. And they'll be, they'll be so involved culturally, politically, economically, anyhow you want to look at it, mm -hmm. such that they are satisfied. There's that sense of optimal satisfaction, not marginal satisfaction that we have right now. Now, let, let, let me come to you, Mr. Yusuf. When it's often said that uh, you cannot keep doing the same thing the same way mm -hmm. and expecting the same results. Mm -hmm. uh, as it stands, there, there's been uh, some words like a sledgehammer that is about that is almost coming down on the state governors. As some people have said that state governors are not living up to their expectation at the time. Now, creating more states would mean having more state governors. So, do you think it is just what we need right now with what we have on ground, with the behavior we have on ground with the state governors? You see, the his analysis is perfect. Basically, this is what we should be looking at. Where people begin to develop, he he did, he said something about bottom top. But you see, the reason why you just mentioned that they are not living up to their expectation is simply because of the reason why we have those states. The very first person that did that was Gawan. You will find people telling you the motive behind it was not economical, was nothing but political. Okay? There is an enemy we needed to neutralize. Yes, there are those schools of thoughts and they cannot be ignored. All of the people that have created states at the military and to add to that, he did mention it. They were primarily from a particular region. I think out of them, only Gawan, if we, the so-called not, only Gawan was not a Muslim. Talking about the, the person that overthrew him, Murtala, talking about Babangida, talking about Abacha. The issue we don't want to confront is why those states were created. There are states, I'm not going to go into mentioning names, when you drive around, you ask yourself, are they on a lockdown or a public holiday? <laughs> but it's a state. And somebody will tell you, no, it's because most of the people live in the neighboring states. Then why is it a state? Now, primarily, when you create state, especially the states in the south, of course there are agitations of people feeling we, we, we are being marginalized, we don't play by, okay, let's, let's give this so that people will begin to actively participate in governance and you know economic development and all of that. But it appears most of the states you see today, like he mentioned, there is too much power at the center, especially financial, economic. So we discovered oil in the south, and it looks as if, OK, this is enough to go around, and even more. So everybody wants a state. And everybody wants, for instance, Katsina was carved out of Kaduna State. Kaduna has 23 local government. And then Katsina has 35 local governments. Why do you think the local governments that are supposed to be the most autonomous of the TS, because they deal directly with the people, why are they all slaves to the state gov you know, governors? Mm. So the more local governments you have, the more money you could actually steal without anybody knowing because the local government chairmen are more of appointees. Okay? So the state the major problem we have with the state creation is such that the states are not exactly meant to develop the people, but have been skewed such that they provide an advantage to take hold of the center. 
where all the stealing can actually take place. That basically is why you have governors who live in Abuja. It's only when there's too much noise, they go and gather the key players and share money and they come back and live in hotels. There are governors that do that. You actually see them on TV thinking they are active in the streets, but that is not basically what they do, you know. Mm. And so, so that basically is a problem we have. But th to be honest with you, state creation is important because there are parts of the country where you cannot basically, uh, uh, you know, uh, you can't basically explain what's happening there. Uh, Southern Kaduna, for instance, in terms of landmass, in terms of population, in terms of resources, you know, it, it's big enough. It, it's larger than maybe two, three states put together in certain parts of the country. But it's not a state. And frankly, it's only represented by one senator with almost a complete absence of state or federal presence. So it's just a group of people living on top of huge resources are not doing anything. But it's deliberately made so because it has to be like that to gather a certain kind of popular, you know, advantage mm. to people. So the concept of state, state creation has primarily been political. So it's aimed at creating a scenario where a certain group of people have to exert their dominance on certain others. And in this case, I won't be afraid to tell you the northern <laughs> political oligarchy exerting dominance on the southwest and the southeast. That is basically where the problem began. But if we approached it the way he analyzed it, it would have solved the problem. That's why it's all about allocation economy. So, so there's gold in the so, so now yeah. let, let's get back to the question I asked. If this is the reason why we, we, we have the state creation at the moment, <clears throat> and these are the challenges that we are grappling with. When we're talking about creating more states, mm. what then should we begin to look at? Good enough, good thing, it is the National Assembly. It is the civilian government, you know, that is calling for more state creation. So what then should we begin to look at when creating the next set of states? Something should precede that. Prior to the creation of states, there, were, there was the regional system of government. To a large extent, I, I would say there was a more healthy competition, whether economically and all of that. We, we didn't go to that allocation thing. So every region was trying to do its stuff. But once we learned politics, how we can actually weaken or strengthen certain people by creating most it became a problem. So we need to dust off a particular document that was worked upon while good luck was in power, the national comfort. We need to look at the present document that has been presented for reverting to the regional government. Now, it could actually work in a certain way, because the truth of the matter is, as Nigerians, we can't cage ourselves into something. We have to be fluid in running things. So when you look at that, I think Awolo was part of those that suggested state's creation in, a, in an you know, ethnic manner, such that a certain group of people will not be afraid of each other. Okay? Even if you don't speak the same language, but it's the same language with different dialects, you, will, you may feel safer interacting rather than dealing with someone who wants to just oust you. For instance, you come into power and you do. Why are there too many people from this particular local government? Or why are there too many people from this particular religion and all of that? So there are a lot, lot of factors that will be looked at. And then when that comes in first, such that you will know, formerly we didn't have all of this 40-something local government, this state, that's it. But once everybody understood the key to actually stealing, not, not to developing. The key to accessing this mm. is to just have state and just create <coughs> local governments. I mean, it, it becomes something else. So I think what should precede that is serious elements of regionalism, where you have a good understanding that if you are the type that imports criminals because there is gold in your state and you secure the area and you are stealing the money from somebody's oil, then when there is gold in your village, it is terrorists that are guarding it, and then you are lifting it and you are keeping the money. So the, the one in my state does not belong to everybody. It is the one in somebody's state that belongs to me. But when we revert to that regionalism, I will have a good understanding of what will grow on my land, what resources are buried in my soil, what I can do with it. And I know very well I can't steal the money anyway. It's my village, so I build it. And like he said, a certain allocation based on the strength you know, the genuine strength of the state will go. Just the way uh, if, if his state can generate 40 billion 
a certain percentage of 40 billion comes to the center. If I can generate only 16 billion, a certain percentage of 16 billion goes. So nobody is unfairly treated. Uh, yes. what, what will be your take on equitable development? <coughs> you know? uh, equitable development, let us define it. Mm. It means that um, development must be arrested in some places to wait for others to catch up with you. That's equitable development. And the federal character principle in the Constitution, which has been celebrated by some mediocre, yeah, that's true. You know, um, is is one of those things that has arrested development in some areas. That's right. Development should be competitive, should be equitable. Equitable because you want to seize resources from one area to develop the other area, and that other area, area B, you are trying to develop with the resources from. Uh, uh, community A or state A may even might even be destroying the product of the development mm. itself, and you can't just stop development in state A and say state B must catch up. It's one of the most most satanic thing we have done to ourselves. You'll be amazed that during the civil war, during the civil war. Obunigwe was a locally manufactured bomb. Uh, uh, what's it called? Crude oil was refined locally to power jets. They were able to get aviation fuel. They were able to get uh, PMS. They were able to get kerosene, diesel, AGO, and every other product from petroleum resources, including tar, which were used, which was used to build the roads. How come? Between the Civil War and now, it's been about um, it's been about fifty, 50 something, something years. years That's yeah. right. We have killed that development. We have stopped some regions, some states, some areas from developing, because we are talking of equitable development. That you must wait, let these other states here catch up with you, and it is wrong. It's very wrong. So I think the issue of equitable development should be properly. Every concept we want to use, we must define that concept very well mm. and then see how it can work for us. As far as I'm concerned, democracy as a concept is not working for us. As a concept, it's not. We need something that is homegrown, something that we could even have a diarchy, for instance, might work for us because the military industrial complex that we suffered from, we're still suffering from it till today. We have not totally emasculated ourselves or divorced ourselves from the stronghold, stronghold of the military. The military is still dictating a lot of things that happen in this country. So we must define our concepts. Now, development should be competitive. Development should be based on comparative advantage. I have a lot of sand dune blown in from the uh, Sahara Desert. What can I use sand for? I can use it for ceramics. I can use it for sanitary tiles, sanitary wares. Why? What stops you from harnessing energy from sunlight to have sufficient energy to enable you encourage or um, um, encourage companies to come in, manufacturing companies to come into your state, establish because there's energy, mm. establish because your they can produce vehicles that run on solar. Establish buildings or estates which is powered so purely by solar. Now, people from the south that want that would want love to manufacture will come there. You tax them, make your money, and they get their resources, their products. They 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 employ people from there, and you see the synergy that will operate. This system we are operating is not going to help with development. Development generally until we reverse the system so that we can have states proudly and happily with a sense of optimal satisfaction develop their resources deploy their resources to use some states in fact we should minimum wage should not be a national issue if in my state yobe for instance as you know i'm from yobe state and in my state we produce enough energy to go around we produce our our um, fuel to power the vehicle and power a lot of things. 
and then somebody from uh, from Aquibon, for instance, decides to come and invest. That investment will primarily first be beneficial to me from from Yobe State because my people will be employed. In fact, I, like I was saying, it will help check insecurity. Nobody who is productive wants the product of his productivity to be destroyed. He will not sabotage it. And he will warn others. He will become a stakeholder that will actually help guide the process. We should have guided development, not equitable development. Guided development based on comparative advantage. The advantage I have based on my territory may not be the same advantage that he has from Edo State. So, Edo, develop what you have. Um, you develop what you have. Zamfara, develop what you have. If Zamfara can produce gold and then sell the gold, not the one they uh, lift illegally and sold 5 billion naira worth of gold to the federal government and they keep these resources to themselves, whether the oil in Aquabum, the oil in rivers in Delta and Bayesa becomes our team. Mm -hmm. You see, there's a sense of total dissatisfaction now, with let's, the politics. Let's, let's look at still talking about um, this um, development. Um, you've extensively talked about why we should have the bottom to top approach. Yes. Now, as it stands, we have states in Nigeria that are somewhat doing well, if we have to put it that way. I, they're, they're, I, they're I have developing. my doubt. Well, like that was what I said, somewhat. At least when comparing them with other states, they are developing faster than the others. Now, the question is, uh, before the end of last administration, um, that um, former president, uh, Muhammad Buhari, is signing to law the state autonomy where you can create your own electricity. It's more than a year after that, and we've not seen a state that has created its own electricity yet. Although I know that there are some states that are still putting works in paper and all that. The question now is, if we are clamoring for bottom to top approach, what has stopped the states? Because if there are policies that have been put in place, recently the federal government is talking about working together with states to create food in their states. These are ways of in getting the states involved. But what is really stopping the states from doing what they're meant to do? If the federal government is saying, we're opening up the ground for you to In sincerity of the governors. So how is that the The governors are elitist conscious. The governors don't, don't have any business with the ordinary people. How many Amadjarins have been integrated, grown up Amadjarins, have been integrated into governments in states where they exist? How many street children, like we have in the South, have been brought into governments, have been conscientized to a point where they know that where I'm coming from is from the streets. So if I am representing them in government, I should be able to take governments or government to them. The rhetorics that they keep saying has been there since the since independence of Nigeria, that we are trying to politicians promise things they cannot offer, and all the governors are politicians; they are not administrators. All the governors, I dare say, I stand to be corrected and I will take up any challenge for a debate by any of them anywhere in this world. I don't want to say in the land after, in the land of the dead, because <laughs> I'm not dying so soon. I will take up any challenge and mm. prove to them that their politicians are not administrators. Now, the federal government signed, in fact, President, we must commend President Muhammad Buhari for that single act. He has kept a lot of things, he kept a lot of things in place, which the present government capitalized on. On June 12, 2023, the uh, incumbent government signed the Electricity Act into, in fact, I'm an advocate. I advocate and fight for uh, the right to electricity. They, he signed it into power, but like you said in your intro, how many states have been able to use it? Now, there is no bottom-top approach to development in Nigeria. 
It has always been somebody sits in the state capital, design and send projects to the state, implement them without really understanding the sociopolitical milieu of that area. Even the geography is not known. You don't even know the demography of that area. But the people from that area will know what they want. You can't give me electricity when I already have some measure of electricity. What I need is actually water. And you didn't consult me. You just came to put it there because you, you padded the budget and needed to make money. Mm. You didn't bother to consult me. How would electricity upon electricity help develop me when I don't have water? So they are not even interested in sitting down with the people. They just speak uh, a pseudo elitist. In fact, there's this thing we call the bourgeoisification of the proletariat. They bring in a member of the proletariat who is greedy, hungry, and infamous. And they bring it. Have you seen the recruitment process? They bring in very notorious people with a baggage of liability mm -hmm. so that they can always bring their bad dudes here, dirty dudes here, to tell them, oh boy, you did this uh, five years ago. So we, if you want to be right now, we will make it politically correct that you are wrong. So there is no bottom top. But the federal government, uh, President Bola met Tunubu, I don't mm -hmm. perceive government. But if he's doing something good, I should be able to say, yes, I like this thing he's doing. He signed that bill into law, and the gov governments have refused, bluntly, because they still love getting handouts from the federal government every month. He signed it into law. I, I, I come from Akwaibom State. I'm an indigenous of Akwaibom State. And in Akwaibom, we have always had, since the first uh, trust a democracy, we've had our, uh, they call it a power plant. An electricity generating company would generate, um, I think, about 175 megawatts of electricity, which is further uploaded, equitable development, uploaded to the national grid, which collapses like an epileptic patient every now and then. Why don't you, by virtue of the act that was signed of the National Assembly, the, the law that was signed by the president, why don't you? Create an electricity transmission company, electricity, electricity distribution company, so that you know that nearness to resources will bring the price down. If TRC, I mean uh, uh, TCN, is insisting you must pay something bigger and above what you are supposed to pay, you produce, you set up your own transmission company, put mount your poles. After all, PHED that controls electricity in Aquibum. Bayesa, Rivers, and Cross River State has not bought one transformer that I know of. So they have been utilizing what the state's previous administration has provided. Mm. So I uh, let me sound it clear that there is no bottom top approach to development okay, so in I, our policy. I know you have something to say, Mr. Zari. Before we get into the economic viability, uh, let me just give you some minutes to say something as we wrap up this uh, regional balance. Well, yeah, so um, it's supposed to actually bring regional balance. But like I said to you, I'm one of those that still maintain that the major problem we have is that the states were created not to develop the people, but to create a scenario where access to the center where the stealing takes place, you know, it, it so you dominate people and then you get to... to, to come up with numbers, with figure force politics, the game of numbers. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why once we are there, for 500 of us or 500 million of us, so we got you there. So we are coming with this and this and this and then you feed us. And that's the reason why you understand that once the notion of regionalism, once the notion of, because regionalism will deal with the bottom, you know, to the top, because uh, every region is on its own. Everybody will answer his father's name. You would realize that it is politicians from a particular part of the country that are always up against it. The simple reason is because we will no longer, you know, you just lie down in your bedroom and the corn in somebody's village, they will make food and bring it to you. And so you'll not be answering your neighbor's name. Uh -huh. you, you, will have to, you will have to walk. 